If your doctor is telling you that HbA1c of 6.9 is good enough, I don't think he or she is doing their job. There are many things that we as type 1 or type 2 diabetics believe are told by some members of the diabetes community or even some doctors that simply are not true. These myths or even straight up lies sometimes make us do things that are counterproductive, not necessary and sometimes even dangerous. Now I'm no diabetes expert and I'm not a doctor either, but I've lived with type 1 diabetes for about 30 years, so I think I know a thing or two about it. And it's time to debunk these myths, so let's go. Lie number one, you need to eat an exact prescribed amount of carbohydrates for breakfast, lunch and dinner every day. And you should always take the exact same amount of insulin with your meal. I've been told this by almost all diabetes doctors I met. I've been recommended to eat 48 grams of carbs for breakfast, 60 grams for lunch, 60 grams for dinner, plus three snacks, each 24 grams. That's 240 grams of carbs per day. And this is way too much, so no, thank you. Don't you know that eating foods with carbohydrates is actually counterproductive because carbs spike blood sugar? If I eat 240 grams of carbs, I have to pump 20 extra units of insulin to my body every day. And I'm pretty sure I will make tons of mistakes when I'm counting or estimating the exact amount of carbs that I eat, when I eat out for example, or when I get a takeout. So I choose to eat as little carbs as possible, following the famous Dr. Bernstein's approach and his low carb diet. And since I've started with low carb diet, my blood sugars are more balanced and my HbA1c is better than ever. You really don't need 240 carbs per day. Line number two, insulin needs to be kept in the fridge at all times. I've been told this by so many people in the community and I've been convinced about this one too. Only insulin vials or pre-filled pans that are not in use should be stored in the fridge at 36 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to be exact. Insulin that you are currently using should be kept at room temperature and must be fully used and discarded within four weeks of opening. You should not keep it at a very hot place because this could damage the insulin quite fast but it's not ideal to keep the insulin that you are currently using in the fridge either because injecting cold insulin can be painful and it takes longer to absorb. The optimal temperature for insulin in use is the room temperature. When you are forced to take insulin directly from the fridge you should always warm it up before you inject. You can roll it between your palms or move it up and down 20 or 30 times. That should do the trick. I use an insulin pump which is attached to my body 24 7 and I refill my cartridges about once a week. So I need to be careful and especially Especially in places with hot climate, refill the insulin quite often. Usually I do this every three days, because the insulin that is in the insulin pump can get easily overheated, especially in the sun. I also carry an insulin pan with me as a backup when I stay further away from my home for a longer period of time. A great solution that I discovered to keep my insulin pan at the room temperature when I'm out, especially during hot days, is this thermal click and go case. It's called Vivicap and it works with all major types of insulin pens. It's super light and you don't need to charge it. You don't need to put any ice packs in it or anything like that. As long as the green light is on, you can be sure that the insulin content is at the ideal room temperature, between 68 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, I tested it here in Brazil where the climate is really hot and the green light never went off. The folks at Vivicap were so kind and sent me this one for free and they also decided to sponsor this video and give you 10% discount if you purchase a uh, Vivicap using the discount link in the video description. So let's move to lie number three and that is that HbA1c below 7% is good enough. Well, I don't think so. If your doctor is telling you that HbA1c of 6.9 or even higher is good enough and he or she doesn't challenge you to do a better job, I don't think he or she is doing their job. Normal HbA1c of a person who is not a diabetic is between 4.5 and 5.7%. Anyone from 5.7 to 6.5 is considered a pre-diabetic and anything above 6.5 is diabetes. Now anything below 7% is proven to significantly reduce the risk of future diabetes complication for most people, but the risk is still there, right? So no, 6.9% is not good enough in my book. Don't get comfortable. Of course it's not reasonable to set the goal for HbA1c at 5.7% for most people because everyone is at a different stage with their diabetes management, but we should always challenge ourselves and strive for better results with every HbA1c test. In my more than 30 years with diabetes, 
I only got below 5.7% once. My latest is 6.3, so not so great. But I used to be as high as 13.3% as a teenager with no access to CGM. So you see, I've come a long way. And you can do that too. But be careful because there are different shapes of HbA1c. You can achieve a good HbA1c with a blood sugar graph like this with lots of peaks and valleys or with a blood sugar graph like this that is almost flat line. HbA1c is just a laboratory test, a snapshot, a one-off result of what your average blood sugar has been over the past three months. The thing is, if you really want to achieve a perfect blood sugar control, looking at this snapshot is not enough. HbA1c can in fact be a false indicator of good blood sugar control. And you and your doctor need to be looking at two more indicators to really minimize the risk of any future diabetes complications. And that's why you should not ignore this video, which is going to take what you just learned and take your blood sugar control to the next level. So click it and watch it next. I will see you there. Ciao.